Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I am honored to introduce our guest. A Dublin native and 34-year columnist and drama critic for the Irish Times, Fintan O'Toole is the author of nearly two dozen books, including A History of Ireland in 100 Objects, Enough is Enough, How to Build a Republic, and Heroic Failure, Brexit and the Politics of Pain. He's a professor at Princeton University, a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books and The Guardian, and formerly worked as the drama critic for the New York Daily News, the Sunday Tribune, and In Dublin Magazine. Named to the observer's list of Britain's top 300 intellectuals, O'Toole is the recipient of the Orwell Prize for Journalism, the European Press Prize, and three Irish Book Awards. Combining memoir and national history, we Don't Know Ourselves documents the turbulence that has transformed Ireland over the past half century. Our friend Colin McCam writes, the real accomplishment of this book is that it achieves a conscious form of history telling, a personal hybrid that feels distinctly honest and humble at the same time. O'Toole has not invented the form, but he comes close to perfecting it. Please join me in welcoming Fintan O'Toole to the Free Library. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. I, I really appreciate it, and it's really lovely to see you. Um, I'm going to start, if you don't mind, before you can flee to the exits by just reading a short passage maybe from the book, uh, just to give you some, some sense of, I suppose, what I was trying to do with it uh, and the sort of texture I was trying to achieve. Um, uh, the book isn't a memoir and it's not a history. Um, it's something somewhere in between those two things. Uh, it, it, it just struck me that with a place that's changed as radically as Ireland has over the course of my lifetime, um, I'm 64, I know you find that very hard to believe, um, <laughs> not 74, but, but uh, you know, I, I, I was born really into a country which I'll try to um, just describe for you a little bit, um, that's almost unrecognizable from the place it is today. Uh, and I thought there was a way of maybe just trying to write about that process of, of radical change um, that could use personal experience or just ordinary family life as a way into the larger questions that are thrown up around Irish history, Irish identity, um, and our sense of who we are. Uh, the title, I don't know if the, it's, it's a kind of a pun, which maybe doesn't work quite as well in America. <laughs> in, in Ireland, if something is really fantastic, people say, we don't know ourselves. You know, we don't know ourselves since we got the new lawnmower. You know, something. Uh, it's that kind of thing. Uh, but also, I mean it in the other way, you know, the other way as well. So, so this kind of wonderful, magical sort of change, but also this struggle to uh, get a sense of collective belonging um, and a sense of maybe collective honesty right, about the things that we preferred not to know for so much of our history. Um, so uh, th this is a, a chapter where I, I'm sort of just beginning to try to write about Ireland opening up to the world and trying to imagine the idea maybe that Irishness isn't just this little thing in this little parochial place, um, which of course it, it never has been. Uh, and so this is just really a little bit about the ideas around um, race, sex, um, and immigration, um, which are obviously uh, very closely intertwined in the Irish story. In July 1972, my father was working on an early morning bus that went out the quiet roads into the foothills of the Dublin mountains. It was trundling along outside Enniskerry when he saw a very unusual sight for those times in Ireland a group of men running along the side of the road in tracksuits. They were big men. They were also black men. 
One of them was the person my father most adored in the whole world. The bus pulled up ahead of the group and my father jumped off to say hello to Muhammad Ali. He was in Dublin for a fight in Croke Park, uh, which is in the centre of Dublin, against Al Blue Lewis. My father asked him if he would like a lift. Ali joked that he had left his wallet in his hotel and couldn't pay the fare. My father said he would make an exception for Ali and his entourage. They got on the bus and Ali said good morning to the few sleepy passengers, then got off and continued on his training run. When he was telling us about this magical encounter, my father kept using the word beautiful about Ali, the first time I'd ever heard a man use it about another man. This was the most exotic thing that had ever happened to any of us. But for the Americans who came with the boxers, Ireland was disappointingly unexotic. Diane Lewis, the girlfriend of Blue Lewis's trainer, Don Elbaum, and a professional dancer in Las Vegas, explained that prior to her arrival in Dublin, she had imagined Ireland to be full of cottages surrounded by fields. I was absolutely amazed at your hotels. I never dreamt you would have lifts. In fact, I was quite disappointed when I discovered I would not have to ascend long wooden staircases leading to some rafter-type apartments. I reckoned on hotels being similar to enlarged farmhouses with not another building in sight. Ali himself, however, had a more serious interest in Ireland. He made it clear that apart from winning the fight, his main ambition was, quote, to meet Miss Bernadette Devlin. Uh, Bernadette Devlin, some people may know, was a remarkable kind of rebel figure in Northern Ireland who had been elected, a young woman who had been elected a member of the British Parliament. Uh, and this, uh, I quote from the... Um, Contemporary reports, Ali wants to have a long talk with the Middlester MP and hopes to put a series of penetrating questions to her about her role in politics, her philosophy, and the things she's trying to achieve in public life. He admires her very much. Devlin did in fact visit Ali's camp and had dinner with him. She would later recall that even in the midst of a violent conflict, this fact was much more important to her constituents than anything else she had done. None of the other famous people I met impressed my constituents at all, but they were all nearly shaking my hand after that. Not because I'd gone through hell for them, but because mine was the hand that had shaken the hand of Muhammad Ali. She would also confess later in life that she could recall very little about certain highlights of her political career, uh, but I remember Ali vividly, she said. My father had also shaken the hand of the great man, and even vicariously, the idea of being associated with him was thrilling. So Ireland as a whole decided to take possession of Muhammad Ali, during that visit, it was revealed that Ali's maternal great-grandfather, Abe Grady, was an O'Grady from County Clare. <laughs> the local newspaper, the Limerick Leader, reported that, today there's many an O'Grady from County Clare who regards Muhammad Ali as one of their own. It also reminded its readers of equally famous members of the O'Grady clan, Stanislas O'Grady said was the founder and master of the Clare Hunt. Sean O'Grady in the 1940s was prominent in government circles. Uh, and of course, O'Grady the poet was renowned during the era of the famous Bardic school in the Burren in the Middle Ages. <laughs> Placing Muhammad Ali on the same familial role of honor as O'Grady, the Member of Parliament in the 1940s, was at one level just the usual Irish impulse of elevation by association, not fundamentally different from the way we had absorbed John F. Kennedy as one of our own. 
Except, of course, that Ali had changed his name precisely to reject the history of slavery encoded within it. For Ali, this was a sore subject. He was acutely aware of the racist narrative in which his white blood could be used to explain away his greatness. He also presumed that this part of his Irish ancestry was rooted in coercion. He told an interview with the state uh, television station that, quote, the Irish have names like O'Connor and Grady and Kennedy. Africans have names like Lumumba and Krumah. We have names like Grady and Clay and Hawkins and Smith and Jones and Johnson, but we're black. The Grady part of his heritage, in fact, contained a more complex history than he knew at the time. Abe Grady was not a slave owner. He would married an emancipated African-American woman in Kentucky. And while the insistence of journalists on asking him questions about his Irish roots threatened to ignite Ali's anger, he diffused a possible row with a graceful dismissal. You can never tell. There was a lot of sneaking around in them days. <laughs> there was no better way to shut down a controversy in Ireland than by hinting that if you really wanted to talk about it, you would have to talk about sex. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the reason I was trying to think about some of these things, really, um, is, of course, to really try to get at something very obvious, and I'm sure particularly obvious to many of you here, I'm sure have Irish heritage, um, which is in a way the strange nature of Irishness, you know, which is that for 250 years, Irishness was essentially uh, something which was conducted elsewhere. Um, you know, uh, as somebody from Ireland, somebody who grew up in Dublin, you know, are, are very obsessed with the island itself. Um, but you, you also have this uh, very peculiar <clears throat> projection of Irishness outside the island. And this had been going on um, relentlessly, really, certainly since the Great Famine of the 1840s, but even, even before that. Uh, and this really um, is the condition that shaped the decisions that were made in the year that I was born in Ireland in 1958. Uh, effectively, it's all about demography. Uh, in 1840, there were eight and a half million people on the islands of Ireland. Uh, by the year I was born in 1958, there were 2.8 million people in independent Ireland. Uh, there was a book published just two years before I was born called The Vanishing Irish. Uh, and it was quite a serious book edited by an American Jesuit sociologist about how maybe there'll be nobody left in Ireland by the year 2000. You know, and yes, of course, it was alarmist, but the demographic disaster really ha had taken hold um, the simple uh, expression of this is that there were two countries in Europe that lost population in the 1950s. 1950s, of course, being the great era of the Europe bouncing back from the catastrophes of the Second World War and the Holocaust. In a way, the repopulating of the, the continent is going on. You have the Marshall Plan, you have the economic miracles, you've all, that's what's going on in Europe. Two countries lost population. Um, one was East Germany, for kind of obvious reasons, uh, before the wall was built, uh, and the other was Ireland. And in Ireland, you couldn't build a wall around the entire island, you know, to stop people leaving. Um, half the pop, roughly half the population uh, of the country when Ireland became independent in 1922, left. You know, and they didn't leave because they didn't love Ireland or they didn't want to be Irish. They left for economic reasons uh, to a very large extent. Um, Ireland was just outside of the contemporary modern world. And Irish people knew that contemporary modern world very intimately. 
It's not like they were isolated and ignorant. Um, you know, people growing up on a small farm up a hillside in County Mayo, you know, had cousins in Boston. You know, they were getting the letters. Uh, later on, they were getting the photographs. Um, John F. Kennedy, when he visited Ireland uh, in 1963, which was a huge national event, um, told the joke about the Irish family uh, who went, uh, stood outside the White House and had their photograph taken and sent it home saying, this is our summer house, <laughs> you know. Uh, the, you know, the whole, the whole presentation of success, of course, is something that very much part of what diasporas want to do. You know, they want to show back home that another life is possible, a better life is possible. That pull was very, very powerful. Of course, Irish people left to go to America when they could. When America was close to them, they went to Britain. Uh, and in the 1950s, they were mostly going to Britain. Um, you know, Irish men were going to rebuild Britain after the bombing. And Irish women were going to, very often to train as nurses. The new National Health Service that was, uh, was uh, starting up there was a great opportunity. But there was also the psychological <clears throat> damage of not just leaving your own country, but leaving your country to make a better life in the very country that you had left. You know? So <clears throat> there's a, an element of shame and humiliation about this, which was that uh, if you think of all the centuries of struggle, all the bloodshed, all the strife to create an Ireland independent from Britain, and then you had this sort of spectacle, really, of of most young people choosing to go to the old oppressor, you know, to make their lives there. Because you could get a job, because also that was a very progressive era in Britain with, the, with that great Labour government, you know, where education was being rebuilt. Uh, so if you were a 20-year-old uh, with no education, most Irish people, Ireland was one of the worst educated countries in the world at that point. Most people left school at 14. Uh, but you could get an opportunity. So most of my father's family um, were in England. All of his siblings were, 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 were in England. And so therefore my cousins were English. They had English accents, you know. Um, and they were doing better than we were. It was just really obvious. You know, they had nicer houses, they had better jobs, they had better health care, and they had better access to education. Um, and I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that if I had been 20 in 1958 rather than being born in 1958, I would be speaking to you in an English accent, uh, and I might not be speaking to you about Ireland. <laughs> you know, I, I might. You know, I, that's not maybe the world I would have grown up in. So, what happened in Ireland was actually not something I know of any parallel to anywhere else, which was that a revolutionary elite that was still in power. So remember, when I was born. Eamon de Valera, who was himself, of course, a child of the diaspora, um, was born in New York. Uh, but de Valera was the last surviving commandant from the rising in, against the British in Dublin in 1916, right? He, he, he was still the prime minister. And uh, uh, the minister for finance, who, who, who really was the person who started this change, a guy called Sean Lamas, had also fought in the 1916 Rising. You know. So you still had literally the revolutionary generation in charge. And de Valera you know, was, was unwilling to think about any kind of change, really. But Lamas, who was more pragmatic, started thinking, the game is up. You know, th this, this, this new state we have founded is becoming rapidly unviable. Must have been a terrible thought for people who had killed and, and put their own lives on the line, you know, to create the state. And remember, this is only 35 years after the foundation of the state. You know, it's, 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 it's a new, young nation um, of which Irish people were very proud, you know, theoretically, to have their own state. It's, it's what they'd wanted. But this to realize that maybe it's just not going to last. Um, you know, we, if you can't keep young people in the place, then there isn't a future. And what happened really was that Lamas and a young, very brilliant public servant, a guy called T.K. Whitaker, who was only in his late 30s but had become the most senior civil servant in the state, um, they kind of got together conspiratorial and they said, we've got to publish something that will really shock people. 
and actually say, we're going to change this place. Um, and it's remarkable that this was really state policy, but Whitaker had to publish this thing under his own name. He couldn't even publish it as a state document. And it had the most boring title you can possibly imagine, right? It was called Economic Development, you know? And it was published in a kind of gray cover with no pictures, you know? And actually nobody paid a huge amount of attention to the time. I was looking at the kind of, I thought there must've been a lot of reviews of it, a lot of, you know, real excitement, but no, no, not much, you know? But over, you know, over a few months, people began to realize, oh, you know, we, we can see what he's saying. What he's saying is essentially, this place has failed. And the only way in which we can preserve it is by changing it, you know. Um, in, in 1958, the, one of the great novels, one of my favorite novels, the great Italian novel, The Leopard by uh, Giuseppe de Lampedusa was published. And it has the great line that's set in Italy in the 19th century with the Italian revolution. And the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the Duke is very upset when his nephew was running off to join the revolutionaries. And he says, why are you doing this to me? And the, 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 the nephew says, you don't understand in order for things to stay the same, things must change. And this was very much the impulse of Whitaker and Lamas and those people in the Irish government at that time. They were conservatives. They wanted to keep Ireland, you know, socially and ideologically and religiously as it was. But they realized that in order to do that, you had to keep people in the country. And in order to keep people in the country, you had to have places for them to work. And in order to do that, you had to move them from relatively poor farms, which is where most people lived, into the cities. You had to move it from an agricultural uh, society to an industrial one. And the realization was that Ireland itself didn't really have the capital to do this. Right? So this was why it was unique, I think, which was that the idea was you can only do this by importing companies, corporations from abroad, seducing them into Ireland, getting them to set up um, factories and hope somehow that that will take off. And that was the gamble, really. That, that was the, really the last throw of the dice um, to, to make the place viable. And this is really what happened. This was the year I was born, was the time when, uh, when, when that strategy was adopted. Uh, and it became possibly the most uh, successful strategy for attracting foreign direct investment that the world has ever seen proportionally. Right. So if you think, if you fast forward to the 21st century, you will find, for example, just that American companies have invested uh, multiple times more money in Ireland than they have in China, for example. And you think about the scale of little Ireland and big China, you know, um, more than they invested in Germany, more than they invested in France. You, know, you think about these big, big countries. Uh, initially, the idea was not necessarily that the money coming in, the companies coming in would be American. Was, they were, Americans were very welcome, but they thought it would be much broader, Germans, British, French, whatever. And there were indeed quite a few European companies who took advantage of, of, of the offer in Ireland. The offer was basically two things. One was no tax. You would pay no corporation tax. And the other was cheap labor. The Irish were willing to work for, for relatively low wages um, because people were glad to be able to work in their own country. You know, and, and they were relatively uneducated and unskilled, by and large, uh, but they were willing to learn. Right? They were young, they were you know, willing to go into a factory, learn what, what to do. Uh, so they were, they, were, they were a good workforce and they were relatively cheap. And that was essentially what the attraction was. Um, and, and so, it, but it, it, it turned out over time, and I try to just tell the story really of how this happens. Not, it's not a kind of direct, simple thing that you start in poverty and you end up with this ma massive riches. You know, it's a, it's a much more complex process of going back and forward. Uh, but now the Irish economy is one of the three or four most globalized economies in the world. Uh, so it's a, it's a dramatic kind of change, and it's 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 certainly been driven overwhelmingly by American corporations. So you have this process, in some ways, of Ireland becoming more and more Americanized over this this period of sixty years or so. And this 
then, but the paradox is, right, that this is all being done in a way to try to preserve a conservative place. And this is the tension, really. This is really where the drama lies, right? which is, um, can you change everything economically? Can you change everything socially and still be the same place? Um, and what did people mean by the same place? What was Irish identity supposed to be? And in a way, the story here is, is about a place that had developed a sense of itself which was hyper-secure, you know, far too certain about what it thought it was. And what it thought it was, officially, was the most Catholic country in the world. Most Catholic country that had ever existed, you know. Um, there were reasons for this, you know, there were good reasons for it. Uh, obviously, Catholicism had been um, very deeply entwined with Irish identity, or at least with the majority Irish identity, of course. Uh, the other big Irish identity is Protestant. Uh, but a majority of people on the island had remained Catholic. This, again, sort of unique. You know, the, the big settlement in Europe after the great religious wars, after the Reformation, the horrors of all those religious wars, settlement was, look, whatever your ruler is, that's your religion. If you're in a part of Germany where the, the, the prince decides to be Protestant, you're a Protestant. If you're in a part where the prince decides to be Catholic, you're a Catholic. You, you've no say in this. It's not your business. You just, you know, you obey w whichever uh, religion your, your, your ruler wants. One of the very few places that this did not happen, of course, was in Ireland. The majority of the Irish population refused to adopt the religion of their rulers. The rulers were British, they were Protestant, uh, and the majority, you know, always at least 80% of the population of Ireland was Catholic. And so what happened then, of course, is that because Catholicism was oppressed and because Irishness was oppressed, they, be they became fused together into this sort of single identity. Um, and, you know, th th this, is, this is obviously a very important part of the entire story of Irish history. But by the time I'm born, uh, it, it, it's... it's become disastrous, right? Because it's, it's fused so much that you have a Catholicism which is not really anymore a religion. Right? It's, it's a power. It's a, it's a power structure. And it's a power structure which is largely unchallenged. It's actually too unchallenged for its own good as, as things unfold, right? Um, so just to give you like a simple example of this, the, the weekend I was born... Um, Arguably the most powerful person in Ireland was the Archbishop of Dublin, the Catholic Archbishop of Dublin, of course. We don't even have to say Catholic, the, the Archbishop of Dublin. Uh, John Charles McQuaid. Um, and and uh, McQuaid, one of the big cultural events in Dublin was the Dublin Theatre Festival, the International Theatre Festival. It's still going on, so it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, the, the 1958 Theatre Festival was cancelled because the Archbishop had indicated his displeasure that there were works by James Joyce and Sean O'Casey, two of the great Irish writers of the 20th century. He hadn't issued a statement, he hadn't given a sermon, like he hadn't gone on radio, nothing. You know, he just sort of quietly indicated the fact that he was not happy. And the organizers just cancelled the festival completely, you know, because you couldn't contemplate the fact that the Archbishop might be unhappy, you know. Um, I, I, another example of this is that uh, around that time, um, the state, there was only one radio station really, which was the state one, the state radio had a requests program, you know, people rang in for, you know, they wanted to hear a certain record, you know, people used to do that. You remember that? <laughs> you want to hear a record, you would ask them to play it on the radio. Um, and uh, somebody asked for Cole Porter's, you know, I'm always true to you, darling, in my fashion. You know, and, and they played it. And, and there was an immediate phone call from the Archbishop's Palace saying, that's never to be played again. In my fashion? True to you in my fashion? You know, what, what is this encouraging? Adultery? Is, is, is that what the state is? You know? So the next time the request went in, um, they played the instrumental version, you know, to, to not have the words. But you know, like that, that, that's, that was kind of 
going on all the time. That was the sort of texture of the way the society worked. And it, in some ways, this was kind of funny and, and ludicrous, um, but also, of course, it was brutal. The, and the brutality was taken out on women and children. So uh, in order to preserve the idea that Ireland was special, uh, the, the burden of that had to be borne by, particularly by women. Uh, women had to be the holiest women in the world, which meant, so uh, divorce was not just illegal, it was unconstitutional. I mean, there was a clause in the Constitution saying there will no law will ever be passed permitting divorce. Contraception was, was banned. I mean, you, you could not buy any form of contraception. You couldn't advertise it. You couldn't import it. Um, all the laws, well, I, I mean, Ireland was not particularly unusual in having vicious laws against, against homosexuality, for example, but the laws under which, say, Oscar Wilde was prosecuted in the 1890s in England were still very much in force in Ireland until the 1990s, you know, until, you know, until 100 years later. And in particular, you had this system of uh, repressive institutions, right, where um, women were locked up with no legal process. I mean, it's astonishing to think about it now, where uh, a woman, a young woman usually who was thought to be in moral danger or to be causing moral danger to others, could be just whisked off and incarcerated in what were called Magdalen laundries. You may have heard of these institutions, you know. And this was, this was slave labor. I mean, this was being locked up for life and made to, you know, and, you know, the symbolism, of course, doing the dirty laundry of the society, you know. Um, you had industrial schools, so-called, where children whose parents couldn't take care of them or who were delinquent in some way were placed in these horrible institutions. Uh, where they were horrifically abused. Um, mother and baby homes, where if a young woman was pregnant outside marriage, she was just whisked off to one of these institutions, uh, given a secret name, you know, given an, a, 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 a false story. Somebody referred to it as the Irish Secret Service, you know. Uh, and as soon as the baby was born, told to sign these papers, you know, the baby was taken away, adopted. In many cases, um, babies were sold to America. I mean, you know, Catholic Americans, in return for a large donation to the convent, you know, could basically get a baby. Um, and th th this, th even now, I mean, there are people in America, this, is, this story is kind of very current in Ireland, because there, there are people realizing they never, they never knew who their mother was, they never knew who their father was, their birth certificates were altered. Um, there are people in America who don't know that, they are Irish, you know, that this, this was the circumstances from which they came, people in Britain, people in Ireland. So, so, so you had this doubleness, right, which was in order to maintain the image of special, exceptional sanctity, you had to really commit terrible crimes against vulnerable people. You know, the cost was borne by the people who were, who were at the bottom of the heap. Um, and this really is, I suppose, a lot of the story that I, I, I try to tell, which is, is how, how does the society live with these, these two things? And particularly, how does it live with it when it's in the process of becoming um, a, not just a modern society, but in some ways a kind of hyper-modern society, you know? When it's becoming the place where Intel, for example, in the late 1980s is establishing one of the biggest um, fabrication plants for microchips in the world, about five miles away from where the Irish bishops had their headquarters, you know, and ran this thing. You know, the, the, these, these worlds existing side by side. Um, and um, so there's a lot of darkness, in a way, in, in the story, because you have to confront a lot of that cruelty, a lot of that strangeness. Uh, a lot of the madness, frankly, you know, in, in the early 1980s, you know, when I started out in journalism, one of the big stories I'm starting writing about was removing statues, you know, where um, statues of the Blessed Virgin Mary started moving and, you know, 
crying or, or, or appearing in the sky, you know, thousands and thousands of people turning up for these things, you know. Um, and it's easy to sort of laugh at and all that, but there, there was a disturbance and there was a real sense of we don't know how the world works. We don't know what are we supposed to be like? How are we supposed to understand ourselves? Um, and I, I suppose the story, as I said, it's, it's, it's very dark in some ways, but in the end, it, we've sort of managed it. You know? It's, it's, it's um, like when you write a book about the past, people expect you to be very nostalgic, you know, and I'm, I'm really not. You know? Ireland's a better place now than it was. It's, it's a much freer place. It's a, it's a much more honest place. Even a lot of the darkness that's in Ireland at the moment is the fact that we're being more open about the darkness. You know, we're actually saying, let's, let's actually not cover this stuff up, up anymore. Let's talk about it. Let's try to understand it. And I think, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish on this before um, taking your, your, your questions. It seems to me that we started with the idea of migration and the oddness of like who, you know, who's Irish and who's not Irish and all this. And I think one of the things that saved Ireland in the long term is this tragic history of emigration, oddly enough. The very thing that started us out thinking we've got to change or otherwise the game is up. It, it, it gave us a culture in which people were actually very used to multiplicity and plurality. You know, if you look at Irish America, and I'm sure some of you are Irish Americans, if, you, if things were rational, right, why should Irish America exist? You know, people are Americans, right? People are born here, they live here, this is their life. Ireland still means a huge amount to so many people, you know, and the same people born in England, people, bo you know, born in Australia, there's, you know, and, and what it tells us is that actually um, human capacity for maintaining identity is much, much better than anybody thinks it is. Um, reactionary politics is all about saying to people, identity is something you've got from the past, it's handed down to you, and therefore, the logic is that it can only get worse. It, you know, any change is only going to threaten your identity. And actually, the Irish story tells us really strongly um, that people can undergo extraordinary change and not feel one bit less Irish or much any less emotionally connected or intellectually connected or indeed spiritually connected to the place than they were before the change. And I would even maybe go so far to finish by saying, I think in certain ways Ireland is more Irish now than it was when I was born. Why? Because it's more comfortable with itself as it really is, rather than with an image of itself that had to be maintained at such a cost of cruelty. Um, so thank you very much indeed for, for, for listening. Uh, we, we, we have a microphone, um, so if, uh, if you wouldn't mind just waiting for a mic to come, and I'd be very, very happy to take questions. Uh, so at the front here, if you don't mind, thank you very much. With the change in the church, the change in the economics, and uh, Brexit, Yes. do you think there's, what do you think of the chances of Reunification. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I, people could hear that question about, about the chances of reunification. Um, I, I, I would always have said, I'm, I said I'm, I'm, did I mention I'm 64? Uh, uh, I, I didn't think that I would see a United Ireland in my lifetime. Um, I was pretty certain of that, actually. Um, not, not that I didn't necessarily want it. I, ju I just didn't think the circumstances were such that we were going in you know, that direction anytime soon. Um, I think it's much more likely, I mean, depending on how long I live, you know, but, but um, you know, I would not be surprised if there were a, a border poll in Northern Ireland in, in 10 years. Um, uh, for the reasons I think that the questioner alluded to, um, I mean, Brexit has really changed things a lot, you know, it's, it's Brexit is, is a very aggressive imposition on the people of Northern Ireland. They didn't vote for it, they didn't ask for it. 
You know, they had a vote and they voted against it. Um, and it disturbs one of the one of the great achievements of the Belfast Agreement, the peace deal that was done in 1998, was that you just weren't aware of the border anymore. You know, I, I don't know if anybody has been in Ireland or travelled around it, or some of you might be from Ireland, but, you know, you, if you travelled from Dublin to Belfast even, you know, you, you were intensely aware of when you were crossing the border. You know, uh, because there were, you know, watchtowers and troops and guys putting machine guns into the car, you know. Uh, uh, but also, of course, it was a customs border. It was all that sort of stuff. And then... Um, it disappeared. I mean, it just went. You know, it, it it still exists. It's still an international border, technically. Um, but but you just, I remember, I really vividly remember the time being on the train. You know, and looking out the window and thinking, isn't the border here? Or, or was it? The, you know, you know. I'm trying to remember on the landscape exactly where it was, and the feeling of just oh, you know, the relief. And it wasn't a big nationalist political thing. It was just, this is ordinary life. We can just get on with moving around our own island without having to be conscious of this thing all the time. And as a result of that, of course, what, what started happening was that, um, you know, border communities on both sides just kind of, in a way, melted into each other. You know, if, 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 if you wanted your kid to go to the school on the other side of the border, they just went to the school on the other side of the border. If you got a better job on, on the south side and you were on the north side, you just got the job, and you, just, and you just lived where you were, and you just moved back and forward. And this is wonderful. This is, this is human life. It's much better than politics, you know. It, it, it's, it's, it's just, uh, then of course, people form friendships. They form, you know, acquaintances. They get to know each other. Um, and, and so what, what it was doing was sort of reconciling people, which is much, much more important than anything else, you know, in terms of the future, actually, so get, getting rid of this stuff. And then Brexit comes along, and it makes all of these issues abstract political issues that you have to debate again, that you have to be on one side or the other on. Um, and of course, they didn't think about it. I mean, you know, the irresponsibility of the people who drove this, they just didn't care. And their not caring was a real moment of history because it just showed that whether you think Northern Ireland should be part of the UK or should be part of Ireland, the British government, the Tories, you know, the Conservatives, made it very clear that actually, although they waved the flag and all that stuff, you know, they actually don't care about Northern Ireland at all. You know, they really don't. And therefore, th this is the big thing that's changed, you know, which is we don't know where all that stuff is going. But it's, it's, it's going in a way which is increasingly unsettling the place of Northern Ireland within Britain, uh, or within the United Kingdom, rather. Uh, Northern Ireland is now still in the European single market, effectively, whereas Britain isn't. That's a huge thing to do. I mean, can you think of any country? It's like, maybe some, some Americans would like to say this, like, let's let Texas be part of Mexico. Or something. <laughs> you know, but, you know it's, it's more or less like saying, let, let's have a completely different regime in part of our own country, you know, and think that's okay. You know, uh, so th 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 this, this is a huge kind of change. Uh, and also briefly, and I, I think the question alluded to this um, very rightly. You see, in you know, 1922, when the Irish state was set up 100 years ago, these places were, were different. They were different because the north was industrial, the south was agricultural. The north was Protestant, the south was, was Catholic. The north was urban, you know, largely, and the south was, was rural. All of those are untrue now, completely untrue. The, the South is more urban, more industrial, richer, uh, and now the religious issue is, is not really an issue. I mean, the Catholic Church is not a power anymore in, 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 in the South. If I was a Protestant in Belfast in 1920, I, 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 w I definitely would have said, I don't want to be in with those guys. I, I, I don't want to be ruled by those people, you know, because, you know, they won't let me practice my religion, you know, they, 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 they think it's okay to ban divorce, even though in my religion that's fine, you know, uh, there, there would have been very good reasons for thinking that I don't want it. Now, if you're a young person in university, if I talk to young people in, in the university in Belfast, they envy the South by how liberal it is, you know. I mean, the South, remember, the South was the first country in the world, can you imagine this Irish Catholic Ireland? First country in the world to vote by popular vote for same-sex marriage. And it did so overwhelmingly in 2015. You know, uh, same-sex marriage happened elsewhere by through parliamentary votes or through, through courts. But this had to, be a, it had to be a popular vote because of the Constitution. And, um, you know, it, it, it just passed very easily. 
um, it passed in every part of, of the country. Uh, and, you know, that, that's a marker of really profound social change, you know. And, and so all of these things are making the difference between North and South much, much, much less. It doesn't mean the problems don't still exist, problems of national identity and religious identity. Um, but I think the direction of travel certainly is, is much more towards Northern Ireland wanting to be part of the European Union and the way it can be part of the European Union is, 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 is by uniting with, with the rest of Ireland. So I would not be surprised to see it happening if I live to 84, maybe. Thank you very much. Uh, my uh, daughter studied in Belfast, uh, and uh, she, she uh, was uh, a little surprised uh, at how um, unchanged, in some respects, mm -hmm. Belfast is, but um, she had a good experience. Um, but it's my understanding that there is just a huge deficit uh, in the north, which is being funded uh, by the UK, and that that's pretty much the overwhelming issue. Um, so how does that get solved? Yeah. Um, yeah, so like, you're, you're absolutely right that, that um, uh, there's a really interesting and consistent poll finding in the south. So you say to people, do you want a united Ireland? Uh, you know, somewhere between... 70 and 80 percent of people say yes if you say would you be prepared to pay higher taxes in the united ireland no <laughs> you know um, so uh northern ireland because of the troubles but also because in a way because it was such a industrial powerhouse in the early 20th century you'd be very familiar with this in so many parts of america right you know places that were you know, when I was coming down this evening, you come through Trenton, for example, you think of, you know, what a powerhouse Trenton was, you know, and, 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 and that terrible sadness of the hollowing out of all that industry. That happened, of course, to Northern Ireland. You know, Northern Ireland was, you know, well, Belfast was absolutely leading industrial city in the world, you know, at the, at the beginning of the century, uh, but therefore suffered the decline of all that. I mean, shipbuilding was its, was its most famous industry, you know, which is, which is nearly gone. So economically, uh, it was in a lo lot of trouble, and then you had then you had a thirty year conflict on top of that, right? Where, I mean, if you were Intel or you were Pfizer and you were going to invest in Ireland, were you going to go south of the border, which was entirely peaceful, or were you going to go north of the border, you know, where somebody might blow you up? You know, you, you, you know the answer to that. So Northern Ireland economically is is not self sustaining, and and the British government does put a lot of money into it. Um, and, and again, there needs to be a really honest conversation about all of this. Uh, I mean, m m my own feeling would be that the likelihood is that in 20 years' time, if we think about that kind of time frame, unless there's a disaster, Southern Ireland will be well able to absorb. Y you know, it's, it's not at all unlike East Germany, West Germany, you know, it, it was tough. I mean, the, you know, the, the West Germany was very difficult to absorb. East Germany, which was much poorer and which had all sorts of, you know, other other problems, industrial plant that was old, all that stuff. But but they could do it. You know, uh, and and I th I think I think Ireland benefits a lot from goodwill. You know, for some reason people like us. I don't know why, but you know, um, like the European Union has been really good to Ireland over all the Brexit stuff. I mean, took Irish issues incredibly seriously and was very responsible. One would hope that a British government um, in the future might be more responsible than the crowd who we're in at the moment, you know, and would think about, okay, we have responsibilities to, to ease this transition. So I think it's manageable if it's dealt with honestly and if it's dealt with um, in, a, in a structured way over time. Undoubtedly, if it was a big bang tomorrow and you said it's United Ireland, there would be huge problems, not not just the political problems of identity and Protestants who don't want to be in Nigeria and all that sort of, but the big economic problems would definitely be there. So again, it's it's just an argument for the fact that we, we just need to be engaging in the most generous, open, honest possible way that we can about all of these things now, rather than having them uh, emerge as a crisis, and then we have to try and deal with them suddenly. That was wonderful. 
So this is the English perspective. Okay. So to what extent do you think it was embracing the EU that Ireland did that was really uh, what caused this change and why Irish people so accept foreigners in a way that the English yeah. don't and never embrace the EU? And, yeah. and I wonder what your thoughts are about that. It's, it's, it's a terrific question. Um, so there's no question but that. So, you know, when, when they made this kind of huge policy revolution in, in the late 1950s, the goal was to get into the common market, as it was then called, the, the, the EU. Um, the EU laughed at this. You know, by the way, at the time, the common market said, you know, like, I'm sorry, but like, you're just not, you know, you're just, you know, you're too poor, you're too backward. You know, and you're just not important. You know, like what, why? Because the EU was only six countries then. Remember, they didn't like. Um, and uh, the irony is, that Ireland only got into the European Union on Britain's coattails. It's it's one of the great historic ironies, but because they they, know, they wouldn't have let Ireland in on its own. It, it just you know, even in seventy three when it joined, it was still just you know, the the average income in Ireland in nineteen seventy three was sixty percent of the average European income. You know, it just, so it just wasn't kind of at the level where they would have thought about this. But because Britain was joining, they thought, oh, well, you know, they're kind of half British anyway, let them in, you know, it was, uh, you know, and it, it was kind of, you know, they won't do any harm, you know, it'll be, it'll be fine. But the irony is that, of course, it was exactly joining the European Union that made Ireland independent. And this is something British people could never understand. If you're a very big country that had an empire, you see being in the European Union as a kind of coming down in the world, you know, it's a... It's, you're just an, on equal terms with all of these other European countries. Whereas for a small country like Ireland, or a backward country like Ireland, being on equal terms with Germany and France and Italy, or even with Austria and Sweden, you know, with, with, with countries like Denmark, our own size, like, that's a wonderful thing. It's an incredible liberation. You know? um, I, just, I mean, just you know, as an Irish person, I just feel like to me, you know, I complain about my country all the time and I write newspaper columns giving out about everybody. But, you know, just the very fact of seeing, you know, the Irish prime minister, whoever, you know, whoever it might be, at the table with all the other leaders, you know, and, and, and that Irish, the Irish voice is there and matters. So all the small countries in Europe think exactly the same way, particularly the ones, of course, who were coming out of what had been empires. We were coming out of the British Empire. You look at Lat Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, all those countries, thinking about the Soviet Empire, you know. Getting into the European Union for them was about securing their independence. Um, and, and so psychologically, we don't see it as diluting our sense of Irishness. We see it as vindicating our sense of Irishness. And that's a huge difference, as you say, to, to how somebody in England might think about it. And the other thing, of course, is that economically, so in 1973, when we joined the European Union, we were still economically just a kind of adjunct to the British economy. Almost all of Irish exports and a huge amount of Irish imports went to and came from Britain. Uh, I think the figures certainly were, so, you know, if you put exports and imports together, it was a, over 60% certainly in, in 73. It's now 14%, um, 1-4, one, one right? So most of Ireland's, Ireland's trade is with the United States and, and with continental Europe. So being in the EU, even though we only got in on Britain's coattails, actually changed and ended Ireland's economic dependency on Britain. Uh, and of course, that also has been a huge factor in, in everything that's happened. I, I wanted to just go back to the difference between the, the, I grew up in the north of Ireland, I grew up in Derry, and when, when I was growing up, the, I grew up Catholic, the, we thought of the Protestants as being broad-minded, liberated, mm. because as you say, they were allowed to have divorce, they were allowed to yep. have birth control, and, but now when I'm home, it's the opposite is yes. true. Which I don't really understand. You know, the Protestants are more hidebound than, than the Catholics. The Catholics seem more liberated. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's 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 it is a very strange kind of irony. Uh, I, I I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I suppose we have to be careful and say that the political representation of Protestantism in Northern Ireland at the moment is very right wing, evangelical. 
Um, I, 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 those two things don't always go together, but they certainly do uh, in, 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 in Northern Ireland. Uh, very conservative. Um, it's, that's not necessarily representative you know, of most of the Protestant population, I think, particularly younger people. You know, I think I think younger people are, you know, very cosmopolitan actually, um, uh, and this is why you're you're seeing political shifts. Um, about half of Protestant voters don't vote anymore in Northern Ireland, which I think is kind of remarkable, because they don't want to vote for the people who want who seem to represent Protestantism. And they can't bring themselves to vote for Catholic nationalists, you know. So they're actually, it's, it's, it's kind of sad. They're sort of d disempowered um, and disenfranchised to some extent. Um, but, but, you know, again, I, I, I think that's kind of changing, you know. I, uh, uh, and, and certainly um, the more the South changes, I think the more that kind of openness is seen. I think the more commonality there is between between younger people. I mean, if you talk to somebody in their twenties in in Northern Ireland or somebody in their twenties in in Dublin, they're more likely to want to talk to you about the environmental catastrophes, uh, you know, or the Ukraine war, or you know, these kinds of huge issues than they are about Protestant Catholic or United Ireland, or you know, the, the it's it's they're they're, they're a generation who are very, very globalized in a very good way. I think they're very conscious of, of large scale issues. Um, and that those, those issues of course are common to us all. Um, so uh, it's why I'm reasonably optimistic. I think about the possibility of finding a lot of common ground as time, as time goes on. I think we've time for one more question, please. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, to what extent, does the IRA still exist in the country? Um. Um, so, uh, the, the, the IRA, in, in terms of the mainstream, what we would have understood by the IRA, kind of wound itself up eventually, I think, in the, at the, the early part of the century. Um, got rid of its weaponry, certainly no longer exists as any kind of military force. I think it still does exist as a political force behind Sinn Féin. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely an influence and an, an authority, perhaps, with some of the, the old soldiers. Uh, but um, the people who would now call themselves the IRA, who are these kind of splinter groups, um, are tiny. Uh, you know, the people who are still trying to plant bombs or shoot people. Um, in a way, that would lead you to be very um, optimistic. You think, well, these are only very, very small groups. They have very little political support. The only thing I slightly worry about is, and I, I try to describe this in the book, like w when I was a kid, the IRA was a joke, right? It was gone, you know. It just wasn't a reality at all. And... Anybody looking at the situation in, in the mid-1960s, you know, before the trouble started up again, would say, well, at least the IRA is not coming back. <laughs> you know, you, that's one of the things you would have been pretty certain about. Uh, so there's always this fear that, you know, small terror groups can inflict a lot of harm. Um, and in doing so, they can create chain reactions in a divided society, you know. Uh, a lot of the troubles, you know, I'm sure many of you were aware of this as you were watching them, you know, they settled down as this kind of horrible tit-for-tat logic. So it, it wasn't even necessarily that people who were engaged in violence had a sort of big end goal. I mean, they already said, well, you know, we want to unite Ireland now, but everybody knew that wasn't going to happen, like, then. It was more, you know, they did that to us, we're going to do it to them, you know, and, and that logic... It's the, it's the simplest, crudest, but also hardest to escape logic in the world, you know, because people get really, really angry and outraged, you know, when somebody comes into your local pub and starts shooting people. And then people start saying, well, actually, the only thing that will stop this is if, if, if our guys go into their pub and shoot, shoot them. And then, you know, that's that logic. So if you were one of these groups now, that's what you'd be wanting to do you know, is to start off that kind of tit-for-tat thing again. And in theory, it could still exist because you still have that kind of tribal 
divide. You know, you still have the Protestants and the Catholic areas, you have all that kind of stuff going on. Um, so far, they haven't been able to do it because actually one of the very interesting things about terror groups is they do need a base of public support. You know, they actually need people who will keep their secrets and hide the weapons and all that kind of stuff. You know, you really see that very strongly in Northern Ireland. And they don't really have much of that. The big fear with Brexit, and this is why you may have been bored to death listening to things about the Northern Ireland protocol and the backstop and all this kind of stuff with Brexit, you know, which is still, still going on. How do you avoid a hard border? You know, we wanted to avoid a hard border for all those kind of psychological reasons I was talking about, but also a really simple question, which was everybody in Ireland knew that if you put up border infrastructure, see, you know, what do you do? You have an unarmed customs officer you know, out on the border stopping a car or searching something. They're the easiest people to shoot. You know, they're vulnerable. It just needs like a gang of three or four people to do this. You know? And then they, they have to be armed, or you, at least you have to have armed police or armed soldiers protecting them. And then it becomes militarized. And then the border, you're suddenly back with a military border. And then, you know, that, that's kind of creating all this kind of tension. S soldiers pointing guns at you when you're in your own, as you see it in your own country, trying to cross, you know, what you think is a border that shouldn't exist or whatever. It makes people very angry. You, you know, so you, 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 you see what I mean, that the Irish people understood that you really don't want to get that kind of chain reaction going because we've had, well, people of my age certainly have had this very bitter experience of seeing how relatively small things started out, you know, and went on for 30 years and was incredibly hard to stop. And we really, really don't want to go there again. You know, we really don't want to do it. Um, and, and so this is why... Uh, while I'm generally very optimistic, it's, a, it's, a, it's an optimism that still says you really need to be very vigilant about this sort of stuff. And you need to keep working to isolate those people, I mean, to make sure that they're not given any kind of opening whereby they can exploit uh, anger or division. Um, you know, th this kind of violence, if it's, if it's allowed to take off at all, um, you know, can, can have its own logic. And... You know, the wonderful thing in my lifetime, you know, is, well, the horrible thing in my lifetime was to see that starting, and the wonderful thing was to see it ending, you know. So, I mean, to actually get to a point, I think we're all in a very depressed state at the moment about the post-Cold War settlement, you know, when we're looking at the horrors of Ukraine. And those of us who are of a certain age remember the optimism of the 1990s, when we thought, you know, the ending of this huge division gives us opportunities to solve so many conflicts around the world. Uh, and, you know, maybe we all kind of got a little bit um, lazy in our assumptions about thinking this is over. But it is worth remembering that one of the things that did work, you know, was the Irish peace settlement. You know, it was incredibly hard to do. It was a magnificent achievement, you know, and it was a great achievement for Irish people, for the for the British government at the time were, were wonderful. You know, I have to say that. Um, you know, Tony Blair is not a figure that people look, on, look back on with great nostalgia. But, you know, in, in, the, in what he did with that, he was really good. Bill Clinton, whom people think of as, a, I'm, I'm sure, a very ambivalent kind of figure now. Clinton was magnificent, you know. The amount of energy and, and charisma that Clinton lent to trying to get the Irish thing solved was extraordinary. The patience that he showed. Um, you know, George Mitchell, who, who chaired those talks, you know, the former American senator, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not a really a Catholic anymore, but if I was and if I believed in heaven, I think George Mitchell really should just go straight there, you know, because <laughs> the, the patience that man showed in, you know, t you know, keeping things on the road, talking to everybody, make, you know, and making it work, you know, and it has worked. This is the thing we have to remember. Like, it's, it's not like everything is suddenly perfect, but by God, compared to what it was like before, you know, life in Northern Ireland is just transformed. Um, and I suppose it's, um, it's quite nice to be getting old and to think, actually, you know what, I like life better in Ireland now, both north and south, than I did at an awful lot of earlier times in my life when I was younger. So maybe that's not a bad note to end it on. Thank you very much indeed for being here.